Welcome back to the studio. This time it's the informer Greg Barton. Um, different setting, but we're still talking about stories that are impacting not only our communities uh, and our countries, but also the world. Uh, COVID-19, um, the last time you and I spoke uh, on a meaningful level was about a year or so ago. No one saw this coming. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, have we responded accordingly? We haven't done our best, George. Um, there were people warning us about a, a pandemic. The thought was maybe Spanish flu, some sort of influenza pandemic, or possibly a coronavirus pandemic, which is what we have with this noble coronavirus. So there were bright people saying, we need to prepare for this. This is going to happen. It's not a question of, of if, but when. When did that come? Is that, was that following on from the MERS and the uh, uh, other coronavirus epidemics that had made a bit of a splash like SARS, for example? Yeah, SARS and MERS were the, were the big scares. I uh -huh. mean, there, there was, there's, there's been decades of talk about the repeat of a, of a 1918 Spanish influenza type of situation. So that's, you know, been there with us for a century. But I think SARS and MERS brought it home. And that's probably why we saw Taiwan, Hong Kong, South Korea, respond, even Vietnam, respond so adroitly. So to go back to your question, uh, those who had had SARS and dealt with it knew what they were getting. Um, we'd watched from a distance. We'd, and it wasn't the flu? No, it wasn't the flu. It was something very much worse. Uh, not, as, not as bad as uh, COVID-19 as it turns out. So we saw things coming early on. Uh, we shut down travel out of China, which was the right thing. We didn't shut down travel out of Europe or America, which is what we should have done. Uh, we lost weeks, you know, possibly a month when we should have been acting. And then we acted just in time. In, 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 in the second half of March, we were just quick enough and lucky enough on the island continent um, to be able to get the results of lockdown that have saved us. We talk about delays. Mm. What about the communities that are very, very reticent to be told anything and are prepared to kick back? We, we're seeing residents in America, we're seeing residents in, in many parts of the world saying, you know, no, you can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me it's an invasion of my, my right uh, to be a free person. So did they, did they delay because they feared th this sort of uh, whip, uh, this whip effect of, of community saying, and we're seeing it with governors uh, in parts of America, they're saying, there's not gonna be any lockdown in our state because we don't run things that way in this country. Well, one of the curious things about lockdown, George, is most of the lockdown effect comes from people volunteering, you know, doing of their own volition the right mm. thing. Mm. Um, so compliance. So it's compliance, but you know, people talk about economic cost, and there's been a lot of silly things said about economic costs, um, suggesting that um, you know the price is not worth uh, the result. Mm. Um, wrong from so many angles. But what, one of the areas of ways in which that sort of analysis is wrong is that most people made decisions about you know you close your restaurant because you take it seriously. You don't want to get your staff sick. You, you, this is life and death, not because the government's forcing you to. Places like Sweden went, you know, rather too far on this line. They said, well, we trust our population to do the right thing. And they should have actually pushed harder. Correct. So that, you know, they've got a terrible death toll. Yes. But Japan did the and same. And per capita, it's, it's possibly the worst death toll in the world, isn't it? Per it's, capita? It's not the worst, but it's pretty high. I mean, Western Europe, it, the worst per capita is probably Belgium at the moment. Okay. Um, okay. But Sweden is, you know, a um, uh, hundred times worse than it could have been. And the Japan did the same thing as Sweden, but the Japanese... Uh, are not just more compliant, but perhaps more self-aware. So they, and, and they were experienced with things like SARS. So they understood that um, wearing face masks, which helped prevent transmission on a, on a train or in a crowded space, was worth doing, something you had to do. Uh, but they were also lucky. But it's interesting to look at countries like um, Taiwan and, and Vietnam. Um, Taiwan, a wealthy democracy, mm. uh, but a lot of experience shut down very hard and fast, very effective, you know, a, a handful of lives lost. Uh, Vietnam, much less wealthy, uh, but one of the highest rates of testing in the world, a very quick response, very good result. And of course, you've got a one-party communist state, so they can be a bit more heavy-handed, and, and, and they are. More draconian. But then how do you explain Greece? Greece? Uh, Greece surprised me. Greece? I was very, very proud of their efforts. Yeah, Greece it deserves credit. Is it, is it possible that great many of the islands and that mentality where if we close what was coming in, we could be secure of what, what we had on the islands? Is that, did that help them, the, 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 the geographic 
breakdown of Greece. That doesn't really explain Athens, though, does it? I no, mean, I, I, no, I, I, I think I think it was again compliance. They mm. they were told something, and they had been through enough hardship. They didn't want any more, mm. and they complied. And the results have been outstanding. They understood that they had no plan B. You know, they, they didn't have enough hospital wards, no, no. let alone intensive no. care wards. Uh, they, they just didn't have the capacity to deal with the surge. And so they said, so, we've just got to uh, okay, try so to avoid the surge. Let's look at America mm. and the man, uh, Donald Trump. Um, he, he continues to defy just about everyone. Uh, conventional uh, wisdom doesn't apply to, uh, to Donald Trump in any way, shape or form. And yet he has a bundle of critics, but he continues to look, what is it, forward and just keep moving? He shows no sense of awareness, no sense of shame. So the sort of psychological factors that took somebody like Richard Nixon to, to recognise that he was going to have to step aside because he'd just gone too far. I mean, he gets bored, he doesn't pay attention, doesn't take the briefings, he's not following through. So we've never seen something like this where somebody's not even really trying and is not even really disciplined. We had that famous um, encounter with Putin um, where we saw on the Russian side they had to walk back their level of aggression just because it was going to look too bad. You know, he, he, he wasn't China's not the likely part. to walk back anywhere. No, China's not walking back, but China's confused because China, I mean, you think about the Chinese proverb about living in uncertainty. The Chinese want a, a, a world of certainty. They want a world of certainty in which it's certain that they've given respect and that things work their way. But they, they, in, in their own kind of way, they want a rules-based system. They want some stability. So uh, when you have uh, an important partner like America, a superpower, the superpower, not behaving in that predictable and stable fashion, I think that really uh, unsettles the Chinese. On the one hand, yes, there's opportunities to push forward. So South China Sea, One Belt, One Road, uh, areas where they expected pushback, didn't get it. Yeah, that's been good. To be fair, some of it started before Trump. Uh, but the, I think the alarming thing is they just don't know whether America is going to be healthy and, 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 and stable in a way that's going to be, meet their interests. So it's not even a question of slipping in and taking advantage. Um, there's a, a real sense of anxiety about what sort of world we're going to be in. Well, I want you to come back and talk to us again on The Informer about the Belt and Rail, Road uh, Agreement, mm. which is causing a, a lot of headaches for uh, the Premier of Victoria, Daniel Andrews. Hope we can do that real soon. L looking forward to it, but I can't say I can, I can explain it to you <laughs> because it's, it's something which um, uh, defies belief in some respects, but yes, very Correct. important. Especially yeah. in this day and age when uh, we would have thought that, the, uh, that a state Premier would want to take on uh, a, a deal like this at, and defy the federal government, which is wanting him to keep clear or keep that commitment uh, uh, for, uh, for, for the nation to, to consider, not one for the state of Victoria. I think we're looking, George, at the sins of naivety and of hubris. I don't think this was an intentional uh, disaster, but a disaster nevertheless. Thank you, Greg. Thank you.